This is The Run Wave, candid chats with real runners about topics that affect the running community. This show is sponsored by Midstrike Magazine, the first diverse digital running magazine. Use code The Run Wave to save 20% off of your magazine subscription. Visit midstrikemagazine.com for more details. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Runway Podcast. I am your host, Kim. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome to the show. I am so happy that you are tuning in for this episode. If you are a return listener, welcome back to the show. I truly appreciate you tuning into the show week after week. First things first, if you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe to the Runway Podcast mailing list. (laughs) I've been a little lax with sending out emails when new shows go out. So I'm trying, I'm going to try to get better at that. So you can go to the runwave.com. Once you're on the site for a a few seconds, a pop up will come on your screen, just put your email address in and every time I upload a new episode, I will send you an email saying that a new episode is live. I will try to send you an email. I'm I'm a one woman show people. I do everything myself. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to get regular shows coming back. I'm going to try to get the emails going back. I do post the episodes on the runwave.com. So you go to the website, um, you click on episodes, or you can just go to the runwave.com slash episodes. And all the episodes are right there looking beautiful right on my website for you to enjoy. So please join the mailing list and keep in the loop. On today's episode, I am chatting with Lionel Adams. He is the director at large of the RRCA. Now, if you're a regular listener of this show, you'll know I had George um, on the show last year. He is on the board of the RRCA as well. And he is, he was a pleasure to talk to. And he actually told me to chat with Lionel, which I, we, this episode was actually taped in the summer. (laughs) I'm, I'm I'm playing catch up y'all so you know everything he said is relevant today and I'm just happy that I got the chance to speak with him he is such a cool dude and not only is he the director at large of the RLCA he is a vegan runner he is a raw vegan runner he is a ultra marathoner he's just an all-around amazing guy and I know that you will enjoy this episode so get to know him and listen to our chat right now. So please welcome Lionel Adams to the Runway Podcast. He is the director at large of the RRCA. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the invitation and glad to be here. Of course. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, I just got in a run and a lift session and scrambled. So you're really getting it in. Getting it in all the time. Now, how do we pronounce your name? Lionel, Lionel. That's correct. Your first pronunciation, Lionel. Lionel. Okay. Yes. So I know everyone has their different enunciations of their name. So I want to make sure I get it right and everyone else gets it right as well. Yes. All right. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you originally from? All right. So I am originally from the Gulf Coast port city of Mobile, Alabama. Um, Mobile, Alabama. Okay. You know, you won't hear me talking about Roll Tide or anything like that, but I I am an Alabamian born and raised, and um, that's that. So I'm a Southerner, and I'm still a Southerner. Mm -hmm. So where do you lay your head right now? I am in Charleston, South Carolina right now. You know, my family is from Charleston, Columbia, Monk's Corner area. Really? Yeah. Pretty familiar with the down south, southern South Carolina area. Oh, nice. Nice. Well, I know all too much about the area. Familiar. (laughs) Um, Know people out in Monk's Corner as well. So how long have you been in South Carolina, in Charleston? 
I have been in Charleston for seven years next month. Wait, seven years in October, almost. Okay. So yeah, almost seven years. So a little bit of time, not a long time. So what brought you to Charleston? So um, I worked for the VA. And um, at the time, I had another position that required me to sign a relocation clause. So, you know, I started within the same month. You know, hi, Mr. Adams. Um, we'll need you to <laughs> relocate <laughs> to Charleston to fill this position. I said, okay. You know, it was one of those things where if I said no, it would be frowned upon, or, you know, they'll politely remind me of the agreement that I signed. And um, they rolled up the van line to the front of my apartment. Um, I was living in Atlanta at the time, actually. So mm -hmm. they rolled it up, packed up my place, just like the military, and uh -huh. shipped it on to South Carolina. And I met them at the place that I selected to stay at. And that was it. Wow. So did you know that there was, uh, there could be a chance that you would have to, like, just get up and go? Or I was knew. it, like, a build up? And yeah. yeah, I knew, but I didn't realize it would be so fast, you know, I thought, yeah. Well, yeah, maybe I'll get a couple of years and, you know, stay here for a while. But no, it was, it, it was quickly, you know, I got hired in August, moved in October. Well, so yeah, almost too much. Yeah. So yeah. So they just, they really sprang it on you, huh? Oh yeah. They wasted no time. So how did you like living in Atlanta for those couple of months you were there? Well, actually I had been living in Atlanta for... Probably this a little over seven years as well. Oh, okay. I've been in Atlanta actually. Um, in another uh, capacity, I used to be mm -hmm. a restaurant manager back in the day, and mm -hmm. I was there. And I actually loved Atlanta. You know, it was one of those places. Um, I know you've likely heard this before, but it's one of those places where you can see uh, people who are black succeeding along with everyone else in society. Mm -hmm. um, everyone is displayed of having an equal op opportunity and doing well in life. And it was inspiring. Mm -hmm. It allowed me to flourish and felt good about getting up and taking on the day and everything else because everyone around me was doing the same thing. So do you miss it? Because I have family in Atlanta, so I'm there all the time. And I, I don't, I'm not gonna say I hate it, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it takes forever to get everywhere. And Charleston is kind of probably like that as well. But Atlanta is probably way worse. But it's like if you want to go to the store, it takes you 30 minutes to get there and then to do what you got to do. And it's just like <sighs> being a New Yorker, I'm used to the hustle and bustle. But Atlanta is just a, a whole other beast. Yeah, Atlanta <laughs> is something else. It it was that way when I first moved there, and every time I visited since, it's been that way and worse. It's mm -hmm. just, yeah, it's its own beast. I miss it, though. <laughs> um, I like the hustle and bustle. Um, yeah. I miss it. It's such a different scene from Charleston. Like, so different. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure the people are a, a, a lot. We're we'll, we going to get into that, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Charleston, are you, like, more in the... I'm going to quote city or are you like a little on the outskirts? So I live in the city of Charleston, um, but I'm living in West Ashley right now. So it's just over the Ashley river, which is to the Western side of the peninsula. Mm -hmm. familiar with how Charleston is situated. So just right over into mm -hmm. um, the other portion of the city. So I'm within five miles of downtown Charleston. So I'm not mm -hmm. very far away. Okay. So you mentioned that you work for the VA. What do you do there? I do. So uh, my latest um, capacity, I am a patient experience trainer, specifically veteran experience trainer. So okay. I spend most of my time uh, working with staff members, um, direct and indirect patient care staff members um, to enhance their communication, their skill sets with um, our veterans and the care they deserve. Mm -hmm. So are, do you get to work directly with veterans at all? Um, well, the employees themselves are veterans, but I oh. am not a provider as working directly with veterans. I do have interaction mm -hmm. in the hospital and the clinics, um, mm -hmm. you know, minimal interaction, but most of my interaction is with the employees. Okay. That's seems like, I, I don't think I've ever met like, so you're a civilian. You, were you ever in the military? No, no, I'm a civilian. Wow. So I would think that to get that type of job, you would have to have some kind of military background, no? 
Well, um, it helps to have a military background, but actually um, being in restaurant management in Atlanta is what brought me into VA. Um, I was mm -hmm. managing the food service in the um, Atlanta VA hospital and got transferred to Charleston. So it instantly put me into the VA and I took another job. So, mm -hmm. Wow. So do you still have that relocation clause in your contract or are you in, you're, you're going to be in Charleston semi-permanently? Oh, no, that reloc look, that clause is gone. Um, so I'm oh. here for however long <laughs> I want to be here. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know that I could do that anymore. That's a little too, a um, little bit too um, erratic. And mm -hmm. I think I'm ready to kind of take the reins and decide where I want to go on my own terms now. I hear that. So let's get into some of your, uh, your running uh, specialties or preferences. So I like to just get an idea of like different things that people use, what kind of shoes you run, et cetera. So what is your watch of choice? Oh gosh. Um, I'm currently wearing the Coros Pace um, 2. Oh is my God. Is. That is my watch too. <laughs> Yay! So I used to be a Garmin person. It was, I don't even remember which one it was. But I actually won the Coros at a race I did. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it was spectacular. It's been the best because it has never died. So Don't you love? Okay, listen. I <laughs> preach to people all the time about like let it, cutting the Garmin cord because we are like so. A, a, like tethered to Garmin and I don't understand why like we're paying $500 for a watch they break all the time they're just uh, once I switch to core and the core the pace two is like 200 240 yeah it's like, like it's not it's nothing like some of the higher end watches but you mm -hmm. get the same and better features with Coros oh my gosh so much better and guys the battery on the Coros lasts for weeks. Like I didn't, I, I took off a little bit of time from running and I didn't charge the watch. And I came back like a month later, it was still charged. It was still had battery. I listen, I praise Coros. I just, I, they need to make me an ambassador. That's what I, yes. Yes. I think it is such a good watch. And you know, I was thinking about upgrading, but I'm like, for what the pace two is like, it's so good. It does everything that you need it to do. And then the price point is amazing. So Coros, I'm down for that. Yes. So what kind of uh, sneakers do you like to run in? So um, I'm kind of unorthodox. Mm -hmm. I am a diehard Skechers person. What? Yes. Right now, my go-to is the Max Road. Um, I don't care about the latest ones, but I have the 4 and 4 Plus. I haven't wow. switched over to the newest iteration, but mm -hmm. those, the cushioning bar none. I love it. So look, we always see Meb in his sketchers. He's like the Mr. Sketchers. I, you are the first person that has ever said that they run in sketchers. Yes. So I, what made you try them? Well, um, to be honest, um, it goes back around the time of um, the whole COVID scare when everyone mm -hmm. was good getting outside. And for me, I was running all this high mileage and constantly moving. I needed something that would protect my feet and I could run all these miles and wouldn't wear out the bottoms within two or 300 miles because I get way more than that in the shoes. But, mm -hmm. you know, trying to save money, I'm looking around and the price point was on point. You know, mm -hmm. I went and gosh, I don't even, I think at the time it was less than $100 trying to get those shoes because everyone wasn't put on the Skechers kick yet. Now, you know, you get them, it's more expensive, but that's really how I started, just to save money and keep running. And I found that it's kept me injury-free. Um, it's got the bounce I like, and I can, I can run forever. It doesn't mess up my stride and my gait. Yeah, so you log a lot of miles. Like, how much mileage can you get out of a pair of Skechers? Before they start, oh gosh, I think lean right now, with it, rock with it. <laughs> look, I don't want to, I don't want to give the <laughs> the dirty details, but I think the pair I have right now has like almost eight hundred miles, which is a no no. What? Yes, I, they're about what? to retire though, but um, it's time. But to how are the up. see? I don't really go by the mileage. I go by like how my shoe looks and feels. You know, if the soles mm -hmm. are still there, I I keep wearing them to the wheels full of shoe. 
Well, you feel my back started hurting, so I already knew what it was. Oh, no. <laughs> I put him in the back, politely placed him in a bag, and getting ready to send them on to, you know. So do you keep a couple in rotation, or you just wear one pair? I do keep a couple in rotation, and um, they both <laughs> right now have too many. So I have a third that I've kind of had, you know, off to the side, and I wear every now and then. They have maybe like 100 miles, so I started using them. Now I'm about to buy another pair. So I can wow. keep the rotation going. That, you know, I I always had it in the back of my mind. I always say I'm going to try shoes, and I never do. I never. <laughs> <laughs> I stick to the same brand of shoe and the same model. And, you know, you're giving me something to think about, especially someone that logs a lot of miles, and, and, and they're working good. And, shoot, if Meb could wear them, we will. Look, you know, he, he, he let us all know what it was. It's a upon us to take his advice and run with it so to say <laughs> and you know what i saw him in boston and he said that you know at the time he had no like sponsorships and really? along came sketch yeah he had like like before the boston when he won boston he's like mm -hmm. he had no sponsorships i said wow crazy and sketches came along and like the rest is history nice well crazy he certainly earn that and Skechers is a good brand I stand by them definitely mm -hmm. Skechers if you're so, listening put me on <laughs> I was Skech just playing Skechers so. hello <laughs> <laughs> so I was perusing your Instagram and I was scrolling and I put my headphones in and I hit the uh, the unmute button oh, and I'm like what am I listening to so Tell me your 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 favorite genre of music because I was surprised. I noticed it when you uh, hit like. Also, I said, "Who is this?" I said, "Oh, okay." <laughs> but yeah, I am a diehard metal fan. Metal, like sometimes the, the dark darker music, heaviest. I am all for it. I don't know what it is, but it's been that way ever since I can remember. Like, and you're like school. old school metal, like Marilyn Manson, like metal. Yes. Look, the things that you weren't supposed to listen to in high school, I'm starting to circle back to, and then some of the newer things I bring into play too. But yeah, I'm all all for it. I, I don't care. I just do it. I just do it. <laughs> I had a roommate in camp back in the day, and she loved Marilyn. She made me hate him, but she loved Marilyn Manson. So when I saw it on your Instagram, I was like, I knew who it was. First of all, I was like mm -hmm. shocked that someone listened to Marilyn Manson, but God, how how did you get into listening to rock music? Well, I, metal. That's I remember metal. my little brother actually is the person who introduced me. I can't remember. I think it was Mushroom Head or some group that he he was listening to and, and told me to listen to. I checked it out and that really opened the door. So I thank my brother for that because before that, I don't even really think I was listening to very much music and just kind of developed from there. So are you straight up metal or do you have a little R&B, jazz or something else in your repertoire? Oh, yeah. Look, I mix it all up. I do R&B. I do um, <laughs> 90s R&B, 2000s pop. Um, I maybe have hit one or two country songs, but that's all I can handle. It's just not my thing <laughs> much. <laughs> Nothing against country, but mm -hmm. I have respect and love for all sorts of music. Um Rock and uh, metal just happens to be my favorite. But when I get tired of listening to that, I bring some other things in, too. You know, some I hear that. Softer. Is metal even, like, still a thing? It is. Uh, you know, those who are into it, they are like really... Like new artists? Um, they're new, but they're not as prominent as those that you would see, like, on the top 100 or top 50 or something. They will be mm -hmm. charting on, like, specific rock charts, you know, and mm -hmm. then those in that genre and the, the fans would know... But other than that, I don't think they rank up there with the more mainstream ones that you would hear, you know, something on the radio or yeah. maybe for the exception of like one or two who are more, you know, even keel and can appeal to more listeners. You know, like ever since MTV stopped playing videos, I'm probably you know, saying how old I am. Y'all already know how old I am anyway. But. I, I remember <laughs> when they played videos too, and that's when I watched it. Now, I don't even know what they play anymore. I, I just can't. 
I, I don't know what they play either, but it's like <laughs> we don't know what like we that's where I used to get my like rock music from from like uh -huh. MTV, but like we we don't get any of that anymore. It's a shame. These kids growing up these days, they don't know what they're missing, man. They really don't. I mean, MTV was it now. Look, I don't know. I, I don't even follow it. I'm starting to feel old, and I don't even I don't follow what these kids are doing these days, quote unquote. <laughs> But, um, I have one that yeah. lives with me, so I kind of follow it, but it's just, it's above my pay grade now. I can't be bothered. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that, definitely. Mm -hmm. So you traveled to Quebec recently. Yes. I see that you saw that on my Instagram as well. I, I do did. my research. So what was that like? Look, if you want a culture shock and you want to be immersed in something different and not leave the Americas, Quebec is it. It is like stepping into any old European city, French speaking city. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. You know, I and I did as a runcation. So I just took off from my room and just ran everywhere. Amazing. So what you just went there just on a vacation? Yeah. Like what I just, made you pick Quebec? Well, I wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. I wanted to leave the country because I'm a late bloomer with traveling. I just was, got my first, um, my passport for the mm -hmm. first time just a, couple, a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And I told myself, I will be leaving this country, hell or high water, granted, you know, hopefully no COVID issues and nothing mm -hmm. like that happened. So I was able to travel. Um, but yeah, I told myself I was going to just check something out I've never done before. I just got mm -hmm. on a plane literally and flew straight into Quebec. That's and, dope. And from there. So did you feel like black in that city? Because some places you go Ooh. to and you feel your blackness, like Look, you, there's no blending in. <laughs> I, I don't know that I've told anyone this or in, any breakdown of how it was, but if you thought that any city, and nothing against Quebec, it's a beautiful city, but if you thought that any city such as, uh, gosh, I'm not going to put any city on blast, but cities who don't tend to have larger populations of black individuals, if you think those are pronounced in certain areas of this country, go to Quebec. It's worse, unfortunately. It you, it was one of those things where I knew I was black, and they did too. <laughs> and you're looking around, it's like, okay, um, you know, I'm being open minded, checking something out different, but you really do you feel the eyes and you know the looks and were they you know, friendly? For the most part. Um, they were friendly. Um, some people had the look of bewilderment, especially if I'm running. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I guess it's not something that they would normally see. I, I'm, that's my perception of the situation, the various mm -hmm. situations. But they were friendly. I didn't have any issues. Um, did you feel safe while you were running alone? I did. I did. Uh, I didn't have any you know, fear. Safety issues, didn't feel like I need to watch my back. It was just mm -hmm. one of those situations where I was very, very aware, along with everyone else, that I was sticking out mm -hmm. ever so slightly. You know what? I kind of, I, I like and dislike those experiences because it's like, I went to Anchorage um, last month and I thought it was going to be like that, but mm -hmm. it was the total opposite like Anchorage was so diverse. I was, I was shocked. Like I went there and it shocked me. So like sometimes when I go to countries and I've, I, I realize that I'm black, mm -hmm. like it's, it's, it's kind of uncomfortable, but I like making other people uncomfortable as well. Right. <laughs> but I you think know? when you, when, when you make others realize that you're black just by showing up and you're doing something positive mm -hmm. and you're, you're, enjoying the city and the natural beauty along with everyone else you would have to make a concerted effort to be negative in that situation anyone mm -hmm. would have have to you know that's mm -hmm. my take on it but uh i understand if if it's something that they're not used to seeing or anyone's not used to seeing but you know we should embrace our differences and mm -hmm. be open to other cultures and other races and you know what? You open up the door for the next black person that comes into the town after you. And maybe, you know, those people who kind of felt a little bit uncomfortable, they'll feel more unco more comfortable the next time. And, you know, the next person experience may be a little bit better than yours. And it gets 
Right. You know, better for each of us as we go on. Right. You know, and that's all we can hope going forward. You know, we have to show up. Representation Mm -hmm. is key in Mm -hmm. many aspects as well as travel. I can't believe I've never been to Canada. Not Toronto. Really? (laughs) Now, what part of Canada? Like, I have no interest in going to Canada. (laughs) Except for Banff. Have you seen Banff on the West Coast? No, I haven't. It's um, B-A-N-F-F. It Hmm. is so... It's like the... There's a lake there, and it's, like, just crystal blue. It's, like, the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. But it's on, like, it's the California side of the country, the West Coast. Mm-hmm. So, yes. Right near Vancouver? Mm-hmm. It's okay. so... I just... Every time I see the pictures, I'm like, I want to go there, but I just never have a decide to book a flight to go to Canada. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it was in the 50s for the lows when I was there. 50s Fahrenheit, mm-hmm. that is. And this was mm-hmm. last month. Wow, so, so it doesn't get very hot there. Not generally. I believe the highs were maybe in the seventies. Um but it was But that was good running enough. weather. Absolutely. Oh gosh, it was wonderful running weather, you know. I even had a you know, light jacket going out at night. You know, I had a breeze and that low humidity. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. So we we talked about the travel. I want to get back to running a little bit. So uh-huh. you are with Team EQ. EHQ. E H. Why do I have E Q? Each E H Q. So tell me exactly what does E H Q stand for? Well, I'll say right now it stands for Endurance Headquarters, but mm-hmm. it's kind of on pause with that right now because it's a product that they have that was working well with my training over the last couple of years, but due mm-hmm. to um, supply issues, they had to discontinue making it for now. Oh no! So it, it was a situation where. Uh, we got on as uh, ambassadors of the program, and mm-hmm. we, were, you know, we had an allotment. We were, I was still ordering. I was suggesting it, making posts, and, you know, giving advertisement for it. Then we found out that they were having supply issues um, and had to put the program on pause. But Dang. it seems to be I highly recommend it if they ever uh, are able to come back online. Mm-hmm. Uh, they make a wonderful vegan-friendly um, powder and other supplements that work very well for endurance athletes. Were they um, made in the U.S.? Yes, in, I believe, Fairmont, West Virginia. Dang. Like, so many. And they're probably, like, a smaller company. So it's probably, you know, supply chains are, like, down and slow everywhere. So it's probably Mm -hmm. even harder for the small businesses. Man, that when you find, like, a good nutrition supplement, you know, that's, like, just sucks when you have to, like, stop using it and go back to whatever or try something else. Exactly. And that's what happened, you know. So... I'm still a big supporter. I still leave it on my my um, social media because I fully intend to come back if mm-hmm. and when the product returns mm-hmm. and fully support them still. Well, hopefully they come back. Well, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Hopefully next year, I believe <laughs> is what I last heard. So we'll see what happens. So speaking of endurance, what is your distance of choice? As far as running my favorite distance, mm-hmm. ooh, I believe that my favorite distance is about the 50 to 60 mile range, which what? equates to me to a 12 hour endurance <gasps> run. Oh my God. That Wait, so how ultra runners are like another beast. When I be the ultra runner, like I'm just, I'm in awe and I just, I'm proud because anyone that can run that type of mileage has like some type of grit, heart, and just what made you get into running ultra? Now, people, I know everyone says anything above 26.2 is an ultra, but we're talking like real ultra. Like, what's a, what's a real ultra? Because I'm not talking about people go out and say they ran 27 miles and they ran an ultra. Like, that's not an ultra. I'm going to give you the real, the definition, and I'm mm-hmm. going to give you the Lionel Adams definition of what I consider an ultra. <laughs> so an ultra technically is anything over 26.2 miles, which generally starts about the 50K range, which is a 31-ish mm-hmm. mile run, you mm-hmm. know, give or take. Um, for me, I would consider it to be in that 30 to 40, ideally 40 miles plus, but that's just my personal feeling about it when i start mm-hmm. to feel like okay this is an ultra mm-hmm. you know i the body feels it for me mm-hmm. that is so mm-hmm. 
And again, that's the Lido Adams definition. So don't um don't quote me on that. As well, being I agree evil. with you because I if <laughs> if we say that anything over twenty six point two is an ultra, then I've run an ultra plenty of times because I've never run a twenty six point two marathon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's always over twenty six point two. But what made you get into ultra running? Well, I ran my first ultra during the first COVID wave. Um, when everyone got outside, everyone um, started their lockdowns and various stages of that. Um, mm -hmm. Races were canceled just a few years, uh, was it almost three years ago now? Mm -hmm. um, so I got outside and that's when I blew my mileage up to 100 miles a week almost. You know, I, wow. I did it. And my first ultra was, gosh, I can't believe I don't remember. Um, I believe it was when I did in the upstate of South Carolina. Um, it was a 50K was my first one. Mm -hmm. So I got my feet with 50K and went from there. Um, but it was really the um, the COVID situation that prompted me to go into ultras. Because seclusion in the woods, mostly, mm -hmm. you know, you're running by yourself. You don't have a lot of interaction with a lot of people, not large starting waves or anything like that. Um, and have a lot of time to really um, experience the pain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the situation that you're in. Mm -hmm. So what are ultra races like? Like, are you running for 12 hours straight or are you stopping to take a nap? Like what, how does that work? So for me, I don't, I have never taken a nap during ultra. <laughs> I haven't. And I've only done up to a hundred miler. So I, the way don't I've say only. It, only well that's incredible I, I just put the nail in my own coffin the only just <laughs> opens the door to something worse i guess but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for me um i am able to run and judge it to where i need to stop and walk power hike stop real quick to grab something to eat or drink you know for fuel and keep moving mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. i found that if i stop moving then the rest of the run will be even worse than it currently <laughs> in that moment it currently would be or mm -hmm. is so wait you said 50 miles takes about 12 hours um depending on terrain 50 to 60 is the 12 hour range if it's just flat and paved or something that's not technical like roots and all these other um adverse areas mm -hmm. I, it, it's pretty quick but if you're having to navigate hills and roots and rocks It'll mm -hmm. add time. So. So is it like a point to point? Do you like loop? How do these, I'm curious. Cause I've never, I always see people finish them. And I'm like, where, where did you go? 400 miles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, what did you yeah, do? So <laughs> I've the, for, um, uh, for example, with the 12 hour or any of the timed ones, they tend to be more loop courses. Mm -hmm. So you're passing by some of the same points over and over, whether mm -hmm. it's, Gosh, I think I've done a 1.1 mile loop before for 12 hours, which was what? wild. But generally, it tends to be three to five miles, sometimes uh -huh. less, sometimes more, depending on, you know, the course. And that makes it more advantageous so you can keep passing by your areas to get your, you know, your setup, you know, where mm -hmm. you have your pop-up tent or your items for your fuel and your, your food that you would need. Mm -hmm. So now, are you training for an ultra now? On the low, but I'm not sure which one. So I'm just kind of <laughs> training. <laughs> I have the attitude where I just register for something, but mm -hmm. I like to just stay ready, which I've been able to do it and not get injured. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm looking to jump into something pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Now, living in Charleston, like I like to. I, like I mentioned uh, in the beginning, I have family in Charleston, Columbia, Monks Corner area. And when I like go into Charleston, like in downtown Charleston, I always tell people like, I don't like to go there because I like feel the stench of slavery in downtown Charleston. Like mm -hmm. you go into that area where, you know, they put the slaves and they auction them. And when I, and it's like a market now, right? So I'll, I can speak on it and I can tell you my experience with it. So mm -hmm. I can't lie. It took me a long time to be okay with going downtown. And I primarily run downtown, mm -hmm. um, but what changed my experience the most is when I went to the old slave mart, which is 
technically uh, where slaves were mm-hmm. basically bathed, cleaned, fed, clothed to sell in the middle of downtown Charleston. Mm-hmm. So the misconception is normally that they were sold at Market Street, which is where they have the vendors in this large mm-hmm. area that's closest to usually it's close to like East Bay Street area along the coast. Um, and they actually were sold technically, I believe it's um, it's one of the brick streets within the old walled city area mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. they were sold. When I visited that museum, I was not able to think the same way about Charleston as I previously thought, because when I looked at all the buildings, all the architecture, it was really one of those things where it reminded me of the involuntary servitude and other items that were used to bring the city up to what it is today. Mm -hmm. And I dealt with that for a while. Once I was able to finally process it for what it is and move forward, I now go, you know, get my run in, visit. I work downtown and I never forget, but it is still there and I will not allow myself to forget it because it's important to remember that and appreciate that, you know, sacrifice for the city Mm -hmm. that it is today. Mm -hmm. I mean, even I did the Charleston half marathon a few years ago. And there were, like, pickup trucks on the route with Confederate flags. And, like, how do you do you, – do you still see that running? Okay. <laughs> so that, that's a real thing. It's true. Mm-hmm. So um, as we have our rights for protests and peaceful, you know, gatherings, um, there's groups who do still um, demonstrate with Confederate flags along the coast, which I believe mm-hmm. is – I don't, I don't know if they still go, but the last time I was down there near White Point Gardens, which is near the tip of the uh, peninsula where it juts out into the harbor, mm-hmm. they fly Confederate flags out there. Mm-hmm. And, of course, they have every right to do so, but that, you know, is kind of striking to, you know, run through that. I think I just had on a pair of shorts last time I did that, and I ran through and was like, okay, let me prepare myself. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of nodded and just kept running. But it still happens, and what you saw during the marathon is a real thing. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get any, like, slurs or anything yelled at you while running through that? I haven't had any slurs, um, surprisingly, but I'll tell you about something that did happen just a couple months ago. Um, I was running in the peninsula, you know, near the medical center district, which is where I work, Mm -hmm. and... These two guys stopped me at one of the intersections and said, um, hey, bro, stop trying to be Caucasian. You'll never be. Just stop. And I thought to myself, okay, is this really, is, am I being pumped? Is this real? Um, you know, so I'm minding my business. It's hot, so I'm trying to catch my breath. I'm thinking these guys stopped me at this intersection to tell me this, you know, what are they trying to portray? And you know what? what was shocking at the time as well? They were black as well that told me that. It'd be your own people. So your that, own people. Yeah, that's what was eye-opening, and it really made me think. And I still think about it today as, you know, what what lies beneath the surface of our own people in this mm-hmm. area, some of them, not mm-hmm. everyone, of course. But what is that indicative of? You know, mm-hmm. what, is that, what does that really mean? And it, and it was eye-opening. And it's hard because, like, natives, they've probably dealt with this their entire lives. And they, mm-hmm. they're, they like, not so many generations removed from slavery. Right. You know, it's something you would, you would have expected many, you know, some years back. But, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm thinking it's 2022. How is this still something that's even, you know, spoken to someone, you know, they don't know me from anywhere. You know, I don't mm-hmm. know my reaction. Mm-hmm. I'm glad I was, you know, r- remain the gentleman that I am and just kind of <laughs> said, oh, I am being myself. Because it, ca- mm-hmm. it continued on about you need to be yourself. I'm thinking, I am being myself. Mm-hmm. And I kept running. And that was it. <laughs> but it, it, it was shocking. Very shocking. It's. A, I don't think I would have uh been as poised <laughs> you know i, yeah. I have to mm-hmm. it's 
difficult. That's like a, especially when you like, you come from a bigger city and then you move to a, a city like that and experience those things. Like I, kudos to you for being able to keep your cool and crazy. Let's move on to something else. <laughs> yes. You know, I, but I had to mention that because it, it sticks with me every time I go out there and it's like, what's going to happen today? What do I need to prepare myself for? And luckily it hasn't happened. And actually I've had more positive experiences recently. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good thing. That is good. But how was it? Let's not move on just yet. How was it like during like 2020 when, you know, the country woke up? quote unquote woke up and you know and just everything with the Ahmaud Aubrey uh murder happened and then George Floyd like what was the mm -hmm. the culture and the feeling like in Charleston around that time so I don't know if it was just me but around that time when I would run it was it was like I would meet eyes with individuals and get this look and it's like we would speak with our eyes before we even did any type of nod or, you know, hello, how are you? Mm -hmm. Like thinking, it, it, it almost was one of those things where I allow myself to believe that the other person is trying to determine if I'm a threat or if I'm mad or whatever. And I don't know, it kind of was one of those things where people kept their distance. But then I also saw others who were more open and, you know, taking more effort to say, hello, how are you? So I've seen both things occur. Mm -hmm. um, so it was mixed. Yeah. But those strange reactions were very strange. And it was kind of a precarious situation where you just wanted to move on and get away. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what's the mix like where you live now? Is it more black folks? Is it a mixture? Um, the Charleston area in general has more um, people who are white. Mm -hmm. um, you know, non-black individuals who live here um, in West Ashley, which is the neighborhood I'm, at, I'm in now, is actually mixed. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different races, um, and I appreciate that more. You mm -hmm. know, I have better experiences. You know, people of all age areas doing different things. You know, people go to the gym, see people running, um, getting up, going to work the same time I'm going. So I see a lot of different things occur, and it makes me feel better because I feel like I'm a nice functioning member of society along with everyone else around me mm -hmm. and no different than anyone else which in general i feel that way so it's a nice mixed um diversity mm -hmm. in this area well when i come back to south carolina i'm gonna stay right in somerville uh monk's corner and <laughs> <laughs> over that area with my people because i just uh, I don't like being uncomfortable and yeah, just when I, the last time I was there is when I ran and just like, I did this, it, I didn't like the stench of the city. Mm -hmm. It just, it turned me all the way off. I, I understand. That. And it takes time to really deal with that mm -hmm. to be comfortable. And, you know, I'm just not one of those people to say, Oh, it's so beautiful and look around and, you know, not think about anything else. I, yeah. I have to consider all of what's happened mm -hmm. to be, you know, be able to move on. Yeah. So let's move on to food. So you are a vegan, but you're a raw vegan. Yes. How did you become a raw <laughs> vegan? Like I've heard vegan a million times, but I right. barely hear raw vegan. So what, what is a raw vegan? First of all. So a raw vegan, um, for my diet in particular, in particular, I stick with foods that are not cooked. So I stick with more raw um, vegetables like raw spinach, cabbage, um, raw carrots, mushrooms, almonds, things that are not cooked. Mm -hmm. um, I do soaking of oatmeal. So raw means it's minimally processed as mm -hmm. far as um, not cooked to lose its nu nutrients. And mm -hmm. it's in its most purest form as you can to um to eat it so did you start off as a raw vegan or did you start off as vegan and then so it actually a was a it, it kind of developed into that uh -huh. so you know i started you know years back i started eating everything like a lot of people do um then cut that back to eating just chicken and fish mm -hmm. um and then vegetables of course fruits um then took away chicken, became a pescatarian, mm -hmm. while increasing the vegetables. 
Then once I removed the fish, I became a vegetarian, um, but was still cooking the vegetables, still was eating cheese. Mm -hmm. And within the last three years, I removed the cooking aspect, removed the cheese, removed the milk, um, removed just about all processed sugars. Um, is that what I'm trying to say? Processed? Um, the unhealthy sugars, I'll say. <laughs> I'll put mm -hmm. it that way. Mm -hmm. um, removed all those things and stuck to food in its purest form as I can, um, mm -hmm. with some cheating exceptions every now and then, but... So how do you over. eat? Do you have to like bring your lunch to work? Do you go out to restaurants? Like how how do you yeah. manage? I bring my chopped vegetables with me to work. Uh -huh. I bring them to restaurants when I go out to eat with friends, and I keep them packed when I travel. <laughs> so you don't use your stove at all? I think I've used it one time, and it was to. What did I use it for? I think I was heating up something. Uh, one of the times I had a cheat meal, I think I grabbed something from Whole Foods or something that was vegan in like their cold section uh -huh. and heated something. But that's been a while back, but I barely ever use that oven. I just no microwave? Like, I don't even own a microwave. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I have no use for it. So you eat no hot food ever? No. I drink hot coffee. And that's it. Does that count? But it's black coffee. So <laughs> it's so basically no. Um, but I guess it does kind of because it's usually roasted. So that's an exception. Uh -huh. And I guess that's kind of cooked, quote unquote, mm -hmm. um, with the roasted coffee beans. But um, I will allow myself that. I'll never leave coffee. I have to do that. But, um, but yeah, raw. So so can you drink like sparkling water? Like that doesn't it, like that's fine. <laughs> yes, I, I drink sparkling water, um, regular water. I use zero calorie um, electrolyte mix that I mix in for my running. Uh huh. Um, things that are vegan friendly, like the company I mentioned earlier as well. Um, can't wait for them to come back. <laughs> but I have other products I found I'm able to mix with just regular water drink have no um issues with being able to um stick to my diet so what about alcohol because there's like vegan wine right you know so i don't drink you um, are yes you are drink. a sober raw vegan yes. yes yes so how did you usually when people mention sober there's like a story behind that so what's your story there is a story. So I'll preface by saying tomorrow I'll be four years sober. Wow. Tomorrow, Congratulations. Night. Um, so the story goes back um, to 2015 when things kind of blew up. Mm -hmm. So um, I hate to go to the south part of this story, but um, that's back when my, my one of my brothers committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And during that time... Um, when I was um, informed of what happened, I lost control. You know, it just was one of those things where I didn't allow myself to process the grief, um, the feelings, and mm -hmm. it got into one of those things where alcohol was not anything to, um, it wasn't an icebreaker. It wasn't anything I could use just um, recreationally with friends or anything. It was one of those things where I needed to survive, basically, mm -hmm. to hide and mask feelings. Mm -hmm. Well, it got to the point where it was encompassing my whole life and was wow. deleterious to my overall, you know, well-being. Mm -hmm. And um, as I, yes, I don't know what the tipping point was. It's all a blur almost. But um, I quit drinking cold turkey four years ago. Wow! I literally decided enough was enough, and I stopped. And it is the best decision I've ever made. So you don't need that uh, vegan wine anyway. <laughs> I don't need it. I can't even speak on it. Mm -hmm. So it may exist. I have never seen it. I know nothing about it. But, um, yeah, drinking is, is not for me. It's mm -hmm. not one of those things I can say, oh, I'll just have a, a quick drink with some friends and I'll be good. No, I, I likely won't be good. <laughs> but, well, kudos um, to you. Because I know it's difficult when everyone you go out and everyone around you is like having a drink and they're getting their little buzz on and stuff. But, you you know, you're high on life. So that's that's mm -hmm. you don't need those drinks anyway. They cost too much. 
They do. I, look, the money I've saved, it funds the food because I'm going through food like crazy with a raw vegan diet. I'm constantly buying, buying. But, and produce is expensive right now. But, and along with everything else. Um, so cutting out alcohol definitely helps to fund fund life. Mm-hmm. So what do you, like, how do you get your protein? Like, are you eating raw, like, to- tofu, like, cold, wet tofu? What are, you, what are you eating for protein? Um, I stick mainly with almonds, um, mm-hmm. other nuts and seeds for protein. Mm-hmm. Um, what else do I eat? Sometimes I do tofu, and sometimes, um, like, other things, like, I think it's pronounced seton or mm-hmm. seton. I'm mm-hmm. not familiar. I don't eat it very often. Yeah. But I bought it like once. But normally tofu or almonds, nuts, and seeds. So do you ever, can you, do you go out to eat at restaurants, like socializing? Like how how do you do that? How do you manage? You got to go to oh, vegan gosh. restaurants. It's very, very, it's normally localized to when I cheat, which is, I will eat some cooked things, minimally cooked items when I'm cheating. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's normally once every few weeks or something. And that's mm-hmm. when I'll, and I'll go out. But in general, if I have to go out with some friends or whatever, I'll just bring my own food and just be done with it. You know. And... So that's how you keep that little fit body. <laughs> Look, I'm not opposed <laughs> to coming in with my own bag and letting them know, oh, I have my own food and pull out my, my Tupperware, so to uh-huh. say, <laughs> and eat right there that. at the table. So do you have any, like, vegan support groups? Like, I know. It's, it's like, Look, I mean, it's part of your lifestyle. It's, that's what it is now. Like, it's, that's life right, for it you. Is. It, it, I'm kind of by myself with it because I don't, you know, my, I can admit my diet's a little extreme. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm okay with that. So I spend a lot of time by myself doing the prepping of food and, you know, staying within certain constraints and mm-hmm. not being too worried about it. Um, you make it I do work. know others who are vegan, but they're not raw vegan. And I can respect that. So how, how are you fueling on like these ultra runs? You mentioned um, the EHQ, but is there anything else? Like you have to eat when you're running. Yes. Um, granola is big. Mm-hmm. Um, I do use, um, I use gels sometimes, but they're vegan, you mm-hmm. know, Catered to a vegan diet. What brand? Um, what brand do you use? Uh, Huma. Okay. Huma. Huma's very good. It works well with my stomach. It doesn't cause any digestive issues. Mm-hmm. Love that brand. Um, but I also use um, almonds mm-hmm. when I'm running longer mm-hmm. distances just to have something of some substance. And like I said earlier, granola is good. Um, what else have I used recently? I used oat bars one time too. Um, and it worked well. So I stick with oats, nuts, you know, um, gels, things of that sort. And they've been able to sustain long distances. You're just a superhero. <laughs> Cause shoot, after mile 10, I'm hungry. Like I need some <laughs> something of substance that's going to keep me going. And you're going 50 miles as a raw vegan. Like that's so commendable. All right. I'll so tell I, you though, um, I, I do want to mention though, is the hundred mile I did, I was running and hungry while I was running. Like mm-hmm. it was terrible. And I, w- I knew I would have to eat. And it's like, if I didn't eat within a few minutes, I would just, my energy was gone. Mm-hmm. So it was constantly on this teetering point of, you know, having enough calories and deficit to be able to sustain my, my ability to keep moving mm-hmm. uh, dangerous levels of, um, hunger. Wow. (laughs) Crazy. So I want to get into your work with the RRCA. You know, I had George on this show like last year or the year before that or something. And I finally met him. He came to New York and um, yeah, I met him uh, a a couple months ago. It wasn't that long ago, actually. And he he told me that I had to have you on the show then. (laughs) He gave me your information and I never hit you up, which I should have, but I didn't. But he told me that I have to have Lionel on the show. So tell me what your work is like with the RRCA. First of all, how did you get involved with the RSEA? Well, um, a few years back, I did their level one coaching course. 
Mm-hmm. So I did that. Um, I took the course in Myrtle Beach here in South Carolina, actually. Mm-hmm. So I became certified with the RCA for level one um, adult long distance running. Mm-hmm. Uh, did that for a little bit. I never really got too serious into it, but, you know, I was able to give advice and coach a little on the side or whatever. But after that, um, I learned there was an opening in the uh, another uh, volunteer position that's known as the state rep. So I uh, did a little interview, got some more information on it from their central or the national office, that is, and mm-hmm. I became the state rep for South Carolina. Mm-hmm. I did that for two years. And, you know, through a series of fortunate events, I ended up um, being voted into the board of directors. Nice. So now I am an at-large director for the board for the Roadrunners Club of America. Mm-hmm. So what does an at-large director do for RRCA? So unlike other members on the board who have regions, um, such as Central, South, um, you know, and other regions that are a few states and areas looped together, Mm -hmm. Um, I have to do more broad things. So when there's committees that come up, um, different initiatives, I take those on. I recently went to a rally here, recent rally, like two days ago, concerning um, a track that we're trying to keep in in the area. Mm -hmm. Spoke on behalf of the organization for that. Um, You know, do more initiatives to help overall causes and also help other um, board members uh, with their initiatives, um, mm-hmm. the races, giving out awards. So a lot of the same things that other board members would do, but more committee obligations and broader term support strategies um, mm-hmm. to help our initiatives. Mm-hmm. I know, you know, there's like a lot of run crews that are popping up. I have, I have a series on this show where, you know, I interview different run crews across the the United States, but tell us like a little bit about the importance of like run crews becoming members of the RRCA and like the benefits that they can get from having a membership with the company. Absolutely. So our, excuse me, RRCA, (laughs) (laughs) I can speak, is the oldest and largest um, organization of running events and um, clubs. Mm -hmm. So we foster, um, homegrown um, grassroots organizations. Um, and within these groups, um, we're able to offer insurance. We offer coaching programs. We offer the Kids Run the Nation programs, which is a grant also to for the furtherance of uh, running and children. Um, and we have a championship series that highlights races that many of our running groups have throughout the nation. Mm-hmm. And it highlights it to a point where we provide bibs, awards, Gatorade, which mm. is sponsored, um, you know, to basically help with their branding, mm-hmm. put them on our site um, to help advertise as well. And, you know, we keep information circul- you know, circulating with runner safety. Uh, basically everything you would need to know, we have localized on our site, but it, it basically ties them in with our organization and makes them, you know, part of, what we're pushing for in this whole nation is mm-hmm. to empower everyone to run. And there's so many other things. Um, yeah. So, RCA.org. <laughs> it's the best way to get the most up-to-date information. So for, for local running crews, do they have to like sign up with the program in order to like get the benefits of say uh, you guys helping them out with a local race? Um, yes. Um, however, depending on what's going on, we can still support as far as helping a group get started and leading them in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But as far as receiving insurance, receiving um, the 501 3C, you know, the nonprofit status under Mm -hmm. our umbrella, Mm -hmm. you will have to be a member of the organization. Um, Mm -hmm. You don't have a formalized board for your run group and, um, you know, basically align yourselves with the way that, um, it should be for that organization. It should be. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes that doesn't happen. And, and other, some groups aren't aware of the importance of it because mm-hmm. things can happen. You know, when mm-hmm. you run all these group runs and someone gets injured at a certain point, fingers start getting pointed and fault and blame. And how do you manage that? How do you, where do you get your, your advice, you know? Do you have insurance coverage? You know, all these different items that come into play 
that may not be thought of. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad you mentioned that because there's so many, like every, every week there's another person breaking out and starting their own club. But like what, what would happen if one of your members hurt themselves on the run? They're going to be looking at you like, and that opens you up for a lawsuit. So I think that, mm-hmm. you know, it's important that people who are creating these spaces for runners, which is a good thing, also are protecting themselves and protecting the people that, you know, are joining them on these runs. So hopefully you guys that are listening at home, you sign up with the art. You know, I think all clubs should charge dues anyway. Like most of these people, they're just coming out for fun. Like if you're a real organization, you have, you're organized. Mm-hmm. And you, you charge for certain services that you're giving to other runners and that those membership fees could go to you becoming a member of an organization like RSCA and getting those extra protections. So, right. yeah, I hope people are listening and, you know, take their, their, essentially it's a business almost when you have a running group, you take your business to the next level and, you know, become more organized and official. So. Yeah, kudos to you for just like getting, keeping, getting the word of the RRCA out there because it's nice when we can see people in these positions that look like us. Mm-hmm. You know, and I know George Absolutely. talks about that a lot, trying to diversify the organization. And it's nice when you can see a black man in like a position of power within an organization like the RRCA. So kudos to you, Lionel. Well, thank you for that. And <laughs> you don't. You know, initially it's hard to realize the gravity of it until things start to happen and people reach out and say, you know, and verify how they feel mm-hmm. and what they see. And, you know, I've actually had someone tell me, I appreciate you being in this position because I don't know that I've ever seen this before. You look like someone that, you know, I, my brother or something, you know, mm-hmm. all these comments are getting it and it, it it's enlightening. Um in ways I did not think would happen. So mm-hmm. it's and amazing. You're, and you're paving the way for the next black man to come up behind you and, you know, join the, follow in your footsteps, stand beside you and just, you know, keep push propelling us forward and just, you know, getting the sport of running out there in a positive light to our people and to all people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I want to thank you for being on the Runway podcast. It was a pleasure to meet you and to have you on the show. I wish I would have had you on sooner. So, you know, we could have had our little chat. So tell everyone where they can find you online. Absolutely. So I do most of my social media through um, IG, through Instagram. So I'm at LA underscore runs underscore vegan. Mm-hmm. So LA runs vegan. Mm-hmm. Uh, name's Lionel Adams. So you should see that appear if you search. I am on Facebook just under Lionel Adams, but I use it sparingly, but I'm still there. Um, <laughs> and Strava. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm all in Strava. So mm-hmm. Lionel Adams, that's another way. Just look for me. I'm Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. I'm going to have to follow you on Strava. I don't give kudos, but I'm on there. <laughs> do, are you on there giving kudos and commenting on things? I do. I have to support my people because it's young people too that end up following me and, and commenting and supporting, and I have I feel obligated to support mm-hmm. at least give a kudos or something. I guess I could be on Strava more since I'm like on Instagram less. So I might as well, you know, shift my efforts somewhere else. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make sure that I follow you on Strava. <laughs> yes, please do. <laughs> All right. So again, thank you for coming on the show. I'm going to leave all of Lionel's details in the show notes so you guys can follow him. And I want you to start posting some recipes on your Instagram. You know, I thought about posting what I ate yesterday and I think I might, I might look at that this weekend. I'll see what I can do. You should, because I don't like, like, it's not going to make people be raw, because I'm never going to be a raw vegan. I'm not even going to be a (laughs) vegan, right? But I could substitute a meal a day you know, do small changes and, you know, that can definitely help. 
All right. I hope you enjoyed my little chat with Lionel Adams. Um, I will leave all of his details in the show notes below. They'll be on the website as well. But if you're listening on your smartphone, you can pause this, scroll up, and you can click into his Instagram, his Strava profile, and even Facebook if I can find it. (laughs) I'll link it in the show notes as well. So I want to thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Runwave podcast. Get some Runwave merch. If you haven't already done so, um, the runwave.com slash shop. A lot of the hoodies are on sale. I'm trying to clear those out so I can get some new styles in. So you'll save a couple bucks. I love the Runwave hoodies. I wear them all the time. And, you know, support your girl. Support this show. Keep these lights going. Keep this podcast going. It is, you know, it ain't free to run this podcast, y'all. <laughs> It costs a couple of coins. So help the sister out, support the show. You know, I appreciate everyone that is continuing continuing to support the run wave. You keep me going when I see you guys out you know, at races and stuff, and you ask me what's going on with the show, I love to hear that because it encourage, encourages me to want to record more episodes, to, to bring more runners to you and just to spread the love and joy that we all feel for this recreational sport that we love called running. So thank you for tuning in to this episode of the show, and I will catch y'all on the next one. Later. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of The Run Wave. If you are a runner that has a story to tell, feel free to email hello at therunwave.com or shoot me a DM on Instagram at The Run Wave. Don't forget to follow The Run Wave on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We are The Run Wave on all platforms. Subscribe to our email list. It is listed down below in the notes of this show. And subscribe to The Run Wave on YouTube, the visual episode of this show will be posted there.